to further that um, as a goal and as a, as a movement uh, in this country. Um, he's been working very hard at uh, thinking this through, having spent uh, dozens of years uh, doing, doing uh, manufacturing and uh, product design, product uh, uh, fulfillment uh, in this country. So please welcome Robert Dunay. Thank you. So before I get started, I thought I'd just give a little uh, background as to why I chose to do a manufacturing company. Um, year, for years and years, we were robot guys ourselves, OEMs, uh, building a complex robot and machine vision systems. And we always saw problems in the supply chain. And we always told ourselves, someday when we get around to it, we should help fix those problems. So back in 07, when we decided to start um, a manufacturing technology company, everybody kind of laughed at us and said, well, why would you want to do that? Right? Manufacturing is gone. And uh, we didn't believe that. So uh, we kind of stuck to our guns, started the company in 07, and uh, grew very quick. Then we all know what happened in 08. That thing uh, kind of sidelined our development process. But um, interesting, uh, something interesting happened, and it started with kind of the San Jose Mercury. I don't know if anybody here reads um, Keith Cassidy's columns. He's a columnist, right? So um, what Cassidy did is, I believe a year, year and a half ago, he went out, and maybe a couple years ago, he said, I'm going to do an article about the death of manufacturing in Silicon Valley. Right? Um, so he went out to go do that, and he thought he was going to write about how things were booming and how it's all gone now. And what he found was quite different, something quite extraordinary, that there's a renaissance or a rebirth of manufacturing in this valley. And there's a bunch of people like myself uh, and others that I'll share with you today that are out there applying technology, applying different mindsets, uh, applying different business processes to, to the age-old problem of manufacturing. So all of a sudden, manufacturing is cool again. Right? Um, and there's a bunch of guys trying to figure out how we're going to bring jobs back to the U.S. So what I want to do today is just kind of share with you a paradigm we believe in, one we're developing. There's many out there. Right? This isn't the only one, and, and I'm not here to say that this is the best one. But this is the path we're on, and, the, and we've been getting a, a lot of good results. Um, just a few weeks ago, we got uh, selected the 13th fastest growing company in Silicon Valley. So it's resonating with people. And I plan to spend the next 45 minutes or so kind of telling you a little bit more about what we call collaborative manufacturing and how this next paradigm shift in production systems could help bring manufacturing back and, um, of course, the IP, right, that usually supports it. So um, I'll, I'll walk through uh, 10 uh, sections. I'll talk a little bit about the history of production systems, just a not going to be a history lesson. I got one slide just kind of puts it in perspective. Uh, and there's another historical fact that I want to mention uh, because it comes up later. We'll talk about why hardware is cool again and, 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 and as a result, manufacturing. Um, we'll talk about the current state of manufacturing, mostly in Silicon Valley, what our challenges are going forward, what collaborative manufacturing actually means. And uh, my favorite topic here, number six, the warrior ethos. What you know, we need to do in addition to automation and, and advanced business processes, what do we need to do in terms of our mindset and philosophy and, and, and kind of the mental approach to solving this problem? And we'll end up with just some attributes of, of what we uh, uh, use in our manufacturing technology, what we provide our customers. And it's heavily focused on the product life cycle, supporting their infrastructure, and so on. And last but not least, we'll talk a little bit about automation. Not the classic labor, you know, soldering, painting robots and stuff you see on the assembly line, but a new generation, a next gen the next generation of automation and robotics that is just now starting to, um, to bear fruit. And we're still figuring out ways, ways we can use this to our advantage. And then we'll end up with our next steps. If there's any questions, feel free to, to raise your hand and um, I'll do my best to answer them. So a little bit of uh, history, not a lot. I'm a history buff, so I always look at a problem by studying history, right? And what, I, what we found here as we started looking at how we were going to design our manufacturing system and as we collaborate with other people was the, the, you know, how production started, right? Back in the Industrial Revolution, we had what's called craft-based or craft production. We all know our history when you know, people started going from you know, apprenticeships and journeymen and, and craftsmen to, to starting to standardize. But it was still kind of craft-based, right? Car 
that's been interchanged and so on and so forth. Then we come uh, over across the Atlantic and Henry Ford does his road trip, right? You can't remember that one. You can have any color as long as it's black. So he standardized everything. He went to the other end of the, the spectrum and really, uh, really ushered in the era of, of mass production. We all know what happened in the 70s, right, with lean production. I still remember my mom buying a, what was it, a Bernada or something, and the handle broke off like the second day, right? And then uh, as years went by, I saw a few more Granadas. I looked, and that same handle was broken off. <laughs> and we'll, at least we're consistent with our quality problems, right? But Japan, you know, they really leveraged that, right? And we could have a whole course on what, why the Japanese perfected lean production. But the Toyota production system, by all accounts, is the best manufacturing, overall manufacturing philosophy out there. And a lot of us engineers in the 70s and 80s studied that. And the, the advanced manufacturing technologies you see out here in the valley, a lot of are largely based on the ideas of Kichiono and, and the Toyota well, motor company. And then, of course, we're in the per period of low cost production, right, where we have you know, companies like Foxconn, building, you know, everything, every consumer product, no to man. I talked to somebody the other day that they walked into a room, and it was a cavernous building. As far as the eye could see, they, they saw CNC, high, gen, gen 4, Gen 5 CNC machines just lined up. And all they were doing is machining the, uh, you know, the Mac, right, uh, the, the steel out, 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 outer enclosure. That's all they were doing. I think they have like 40% of the world CNC machines. All the aluminum that's going there. I mean, it's crazy, right? It's all low cost, but it has its problems. And then, of course, we wind up with uh, what we think is the next paradigm, right? And we call it collaborative manufacturing, or the collaborative production system. Um, there's, as you'll see as we talk about the characteristics of it, that there's a lot of, um, you know, you could call it a lot of different things. But the bottom line is it's going to require people with OEM level skills working with other OEM level people, working together to try to bring this stuff back. And that'll be the main focus of the next talk. Now one more, has, yes, question. Sure. First for me to use this one, so it's an innovative day. Um, I, I think it's great the way you put the historical context there, but there seems to be something missing between three and four because the kind of first offshore manufacturing was done about 82, 83 when Seagate went to Singapore. And that was done not necessarily to really get low cost production, but to veneer customers and to get people that can actually do the job. So the first uh, generation of Silicon Valley offshoring was done really between three and four there. And it became quite a, uh, quite a significant kind of movement. And it kind of, from there, it sort of percolated through the rest of Southeast Asia from a cost basis. How, how does that fit in between three and four? And how, how would you comment on that? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, in fact, there's a couple other striations here, right, if we really wanted to focus on the history. I, mean, I recommend uh, a book called, you know, The Machine That Changed the World. Uh, that's a book about the history of production systems. But you're right, the Valley's a little bit unique, of course, right? I was part of the semiconductor equipment industry movement when that started going offshore. But a lot of people don't realize that if you looked at semi-equipment companies in the early 80s, the top 10 list was all Japanese, right? And because we just didn't have the skills and we had problems. And, uh, you know, we all worked very hard. I was a young engineer at the time, and me and my friends, we worked 80-hour weeks for many years and to try to fix that. Semitech, right? Remember those guys came out? And what we finally did all together as a, as a community is by the end of the decade, the top eight companies were all U.S. Absolutely, right. absolutely. But one of the biggest problems we had at KLA Tencor, where I was, was skill set, right? And and people just, you know, and then we still have that problem, right? It's hard to get technical talent. You know, my our kids, they all want to take sociology, you know, plus communications degree type programs. Nobody wants to study engineering here. But absolutely, there's there's a fascinating history here, and I promised myself I wouldn't, you know, do a history lesson. But uh, that's a very good. Well, Right, absolutely. Any other questions on this slide? 
Okay, the other thing I just wanted to bring out is this concept of an intersection or the Medici effect, right? It's a very important part of uh, what we did when we started uh, figuring out how, how best to improve our manufacturing system. An intersection is quite simply just getting a group of people together from different walks of life, different perspectives, right? Solving a common problem. The Medici's were like the first VCs, right? They put a, a, buck, buck thing, a sack of money in the middle of the table, get a baker, you know, uh, an, uh, an artist, an engineer, right? S several people and say, look, let's design a new, better sewage system, or whatever the problem may be. Uh, that's been called the Medici effect also. Uh, we use the term intersection a lot, it'll come up in, in here. But we've seen the power of putting five people in a room from different backgrounds, different uh, uh, skill sets, and, and, and the innov innovative ways we've come up with solutions. So a lot of what you'll see and hear me talk about today is the result of, of these intersections. Uh, as, as we all know, the Renaissance was fueled by this, right? Florence was kind of ground zero for it. This new manufacturing Renaissance is kind of being fueled by people coming from all over the world, some coming back from Singapore, right? I have customers that come into my uh, offices every day saying, we're bringing stuff back because of these reasons. How are you going to solve these reasons? So more on that in a moment. So uh, hardware is cool again. Uh, yeah, this hit me uh, the other day. Uh, those of us that have been manufacturing all our careers, we always thought it was cool. But for lots of reasons, right, especially on the Sand Hill Road, most people would only invest, uh, investors only invest in software, or social media, or networking, or rest companies. The last time um, I knew anyone that got any money for a mechanical or a hardware startup, right, was, was years and years ago, although it's starting to change. In fact, in the 35 years I've been in this business, uh, trying to get on Sand Hill Road with various ideas, I only made it once, and that was for a sports and entertainment company, <laughs> for hardware. And I, and I was able to get in there and almost raise $60 million to, to buy the Pride organization, which for those of you that follow mixed martial arts. So I, I never actually pitched to a VC when it came to hardware. It just would, the doors would close, right? They'd hear, oh, you're a semi-equipment guy? Oh, you build hardware. Oh, we don't need that. Well, uh, fast forward to two months ago, and I was, went to a, uh, a group gathering in San Francisco at a panel of Sand Hill VC up there. And they proclaimed this. They said, hardware is cool again. And the reasons for it, and it was very fascinating to all of us there, were that uh, were these four reasons, right? The, 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 the main one is that these, well, it starts with these makers, right? These entrepreneurs that are very young, very driven. I'm sure you're starting to hear this term. We see these kids come through all the time, right? And they're very open you know, source. Everything's open source. Everything's free. Everything's shareware. It's very collaborative, right? And so these guys called us into this meeting. And they talked about how investors were starting to put money back into hardware companies because, uh, for example, uh, software tools are easily available, right? In our day, 10, 15 years ago, you had to buy a mentor graphics program. Or I remember when I was an optical engineer, the lens design program was $40,000. You know, it's crazy. Now you can get it for free, right? So software CAD tools are available. Uh, this 3D printing and other rapid prototyping technologies, it's in the paper almost every day. We just bought one. You know, it's the most popular tool in, in the company. Uh, and it's amazing. And I'm sure you guys heard about those kids in Austin that are manufacturing guns, right? Have you guys followed this story? They're manufacturing guns in their, in their basement on their spare, in their spare time. And people are sending in drawings and stuff and helping them design the parts, and they're coming up with plastic guns that work. I mean, that's kind of a scary thing, right? But it's, uh, it's pretty amazing the speed at which rapid prototyping is hitting. Um, also, there's easy access to pilot and prototype production kind of equipment and training. Um, and who here has heard of Tech Shop? Yeah, it's starting to grow like crazy. We were the first guys to engage with those, and uh, one of my engineers, I think, he, I think he was the first or second guy to be trained on every piece of equipment. Uh, we just developed a computer controlled barbecue. Uh, for those of you who want to be uh, <laughs> grill masters, pit masters, and not, you know, spend years learning how to do it. And we did it all at all their equipment. And then last but not least, they, the VC talked about these advanced manufacturing companies, right? Companies uh, that you know, we're, we're talking about now, we'll talk about some more, that are trying to solve a manufacturing problem using innovative different techniques. So they said because those people exist, along with these other uh, enablers, they are now investing heavily in 
hardware. Um, the current state of manufacturing, it's very exciting. You just open the paper and you, things jump out at you. I'm sure you guys have seen all these articles. This is Google, right? They're, they're going for a made in the USA uh, uh, policy. We've heard this, you know, we've done some business with Google. We've heard it through the grapevine for years, but they're serious, right? So this is one of their new wireless, uh, you know, uh, products that they actually are designing and manufacturing in, in the USA. And most all of it is in Silicon Valley. Now this is a very difficult to get label, right? You have to have like 90% uh, of your parts purchased. I mean, it's, it's very stringent. So for Google to do that, it's funny, I think they took an ad out and said, Apple, your move, right? We didn't do anything with it. The next move is yours. So we've heard, uh, my, one of my board members, ex-treasurer of Apple, you know, he has a lot of connections, and has scrambled me from over here to try to address Google's uh, challenge. Uh, F Flextronics, um, we were actually uh, introduced to this article uh, by Forbes magazine. They came to our place, took some pictures. And then they sh kind of shared with us other things they were doing. And uh, Flextronics basically brought their NPI center back to the U.S., right? And, you know, there's some old San Mina buildings out there in Fremont that they, you know, redid. And it's pretty exciting, right? They're, they're, they're saying, look, we're, we're going to design, develop, and manufacture products for all of our customers. So uh, I think Apple is, is working with these guys. We don't know that. But uh, they're doing some interesting stuff. Yeah, what's going on? How is some of these things are backlogged in yeah, so what's happening, um, well, that's a great question. Uh, customers are actually demanding, right? There's a couple things going on. Customers are saying, look, I'm buying your product. I'm only going to buy your product if you build it in the U.S. I just had a call the other day. A guy told me that ho American hospitals, when they buy equipment, if they're a uh, municipal or county hospital, they have directors only buy U.S., right? The other uh, other reasons why is the, you know, some of the, the price is going up overseas. We're all here, and cost of living is going up. Um, you know, when you when you when you go to an offshore contract manufacturer now, and you negotiate your price, you have to ask them: Does this price include riot police or, or no riot police? I mean, the, the suicide nets or not? Right? I mean, it's chaos over there. I don't know how much how many of you guys have gone over there to do some business, but it's there's some crazy things happening. Okay, exactly. Uh, some we were we we're over there and talking to some people and uh, some average people on the street. And they, they said something else that was very interesting. They said, look, the Chinese government is just spoon-feeding us, you know, cost of living improvements and better life and everything. And they had this, they had this interesting comment where, you know, my grandmother was lucky to get a bike. My mom was lucky to get a washing machine. And I want a diamond ring, you know, and a big screen TV. <laughs> so their point was the government's slowly, you know, improving their life, but the patience is running out. So there's there, there's concern that that they can keep up with the demand for improved quality of life. So they have to raise wages, right? And as a result, cost is going up. And then there's the IP threat, right? There's uh, we're getting started on that. There's some crazy stories about that. Well, what happens is you go over there, they'll tell you they can build it, right? And they can't because it's complex. And then you send your engineers over and you close that gap, right? The gap that between where they are and where they need to be. And then finally, you close that gap by sending your engineers over there for years. And you go, Eureka, I can now, you know, uh, I can now recognize my concept. So you create a competitor. And then stuff goes out the back door, or someone's brother wants to take the disc or whatever. So all these reasons together uh, is pushing for, uh, the, manu the US manufacturer of the, uh, the OEM to try to come back and find solutions stateside. Did that, that answer your question? Or did you have a question? I just want to ask, uh, as part of that, how important is proximity to the engineers and the shortage that exists outside? Oh, great question. So some of the stuff we're going to cover later on, but I, I don't mind covering it a bit now. Proximity is huge. One of the things that um, engineers want, the reason why manufacturing, when we say manufacturing, it's not just you know full-scale manufacturing, right? Uh, that's kind of the holy grail. People want to start mass producing, but there's, there's prototype and pilot production where you have incubator hatchery, prototype labs, whatever you call it. And the engineers want to be there. They don't want to go on planes. I, I talked to one engineer. He said he was on a plane 36 times in 40 months. For 40 months, he was on a plane. So he's basically on a plane every month for three weeks. Come home for a week, get back on a plane. 
So, you know, and then there's the time, you know, if, if, if you've ever done business overseas, which it doesn't matter what country you're in, hey, we have trouble doing business with, with people back east. <laughs> and that's the same country three hours. So you can imagine the logistics, communication, uh, and other problems. So proximity is huge. The engineers are, are, are demanding it. Uh, and I'll mention one more thing that's interesting. Um, we, just, we just discovered this. When we talk to customers, especially the young kids, the makers, right? They come in and they say, look, I want to build my product in the U.S., right? They're not the hardcore entrepreneurs we're all used to, right? Where it's all about making money. These guys want to preserve, you know, their American way. They're a lot more, uh, you know, traditional than you think they are. So they come in, they say, look, you guys, right, our generation for the last 30 years made some bad decisions. And now, you know, IP's gone, jobs are gone. We want to reverse that. So we actually see the young makers or the young inventors coming in and insisting that we, the older generation, figure out ways to help them build in the U.S. Even if they have to give up a little profit or a lot of profit, but we do. Is that, is that interesting? So in addition to Flextronics, you have Tesla. They're doing a lot of insourcing. Tesla's the largest startup that Silicon Valley's ever seen. Anybody been to the Tesla plant yet? It's amazing. Just incredible what they're doing. So uh, we're pretty close with these guys, working on some projects with them. Um, I know the VP of supply chain, a fascinating guy, and he, you know, th these guys are doing some very progressive stuff, right? I can't get into a lot of detail, but you know, in addition to you know using the classic robots to build cars and things, these guys are one of the you know elite group of uh, manufacturing technology companies that we're profiling here. Um, and, and it's resulting in some pretty cool stuff. Uh, I had to put two slides in for Tesla because this car is beautiful. The S-Class. Have you guys seen this on the road yet? It's just oh, beautiful. And uh, you know, it's, it's the first four-door that looks as beautiful as a coupe. Think about it. You know, usually coupes look this way. So everything from industrial design to reliability, these guys have really done a great job and really proved it right to all of us that you can design and manufacture the USA successfully. And I think they have 50,000 plus units on back order. Uh, the people we talk to that drive them love them. Right? They're not just uh, beautiful cars, but they work. So they work very well. So let's talk a little bit about continuing challenges. This is just a common graph you see all the time. I just wanted to kind of show this. Uh, this is what you know the younger generation is looking at. They seem to know this stuff more than we do. But the, you know, China, for example, right? Is they, they moved up the the, the uh, point where they surpass us in GDPs and from 2040 to 2027. I know we've heard you know, talk to people who said that they think it's even sooner, right? So there's a lot of you know competition out there, right? You know, I don't want to just pick on China, right? There's some all five factors out there, and you know, Brazil, you name it, India, everyone's out there, right? Trying to uh, get what we have. So these are some challenges that we need to look at, and one of the ways we can address that is by uh, solving some of these direct problems, right? We know unemployment's up still. It's not coming down. This is the one I talk about a lot because my, my kids you know, went through that. I'm sure for those of you with college-age kids, you know, a bachelor's degree doesn't do anything with this. Right? Like we call them Starbucks kids. All these kids are working at Starbucks. Both my kids had to go back to grad school. Right? Of course, they picked, you know, my son went to Columbia uh, for law school. My daughter went to NYU uh, to be a therapist. So it's killing us financially because they couldn't get jobs, right, uh, with their four-year degree. None of their friends could, too. In fact, my son, he, uh, Columbia's one of the top law schools, and uh, typically when you graduate from Columbia, um, you have 15 job interviews, you have 13 offers. He graduated, he had 15 job interviews, zero offers. Zero. That was brutal. And the only way he got a job here is because you know, he's, a, he, he's got two black belts and one of my lawyer buddies, you know, they represent Strike Force. I know you follow all the MMA stuff. So they're all, and, and I just opened the door so they put him in a list of 100 uh, interviews, right? They just snuck him in and, and, and there's three jobs for 100 interviews. And he just lucked out and got, got a job. Like the, the only the only kid in his class or in the group he hung out with was working working as a lawyer. Everyone else is unemployed. So 
So it's brutal. You know, we all know these statistics, right? We graduate more lawyers than engineers. <coughs> uh, you know, engineers are all over the place. Uh, in other countries, right, we don't have enough of them over here. IP is diffusing. That's a nice word, you know, to describe that it's just kind of moving, right, away from, from their owners. Can't tell you how many people have told their horror stories about this. And then, then our favorite topic is we'll just, just stop and talk about this concept uh, phenomena of quality drift, right? Uh, if you go overseas, right, if, even if you go outside domestically with this, right, people will start cutting costs and they won't tell you. It is true, right? Um, there's a great book out called um, Fully Made in China. If you haven't read it yet, read it. It, it talks all about this concept. And it's a very scary concept. And most U.S. companies don't know about it. We're just le we're learning. We knew it anecdotally, but now there's proof and evidence. But it's buyer beware out there, right? If you don't build your own product. Go ahead. So um, over at the uh, the Mimi plant, uh, or Tesla plant was the Mimi. With all this happening that we're talking about and all this work, what do we do and what do we not do? So, you know, because that really, the report I read was that really was the start of the whole trend for what we're doing with this product. Right, right. So, a uh, great question. Uh, part of our solution, and we'll talk about, I'll have some, some uh, more detailed uh, info on that later, but part of our solution is to, when we talk about collaboration, it's really, to collaborate, you have to be uh, at least on par with the person you're talking to, right? For example, it's hard for a four-year-old to collaborate with a, with a 20-year-old. Right? You have to at least know what that 20-year-old is do doing and thinking. So what we uh, what we propose, right, is that suppliers have an OEM level of knowledge, minimum, right, so that you can work with your with your customers to solve problems collectively. So there's a f philosophical shift that has to happen. We're, we're, what we're saying is you should only work with suppliers that understand your problem, right? And then open up. Instead of having conflict-based uh, you know, relationships, it should be collaboration-based relationships. Uh, then there's a technology play, too. And I have a slide that shows what we're doing. We developed a product, right? Uh, I, I don't want to you know, take all this time. I'm going to use my last slide. <laughs> we developed a product that helps push collaboration at a very high level. The to catch quality problem. So if you could just hold on to that question, I think I, I can cover it a, a little in a little more detail with a specific slide. Question. Uh, to, to that point, and I think it's an interesting point. I think these problems are all real problems and, 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 and you know things we need to do stuff about. But the real issue is economic at the end of the day. I mean, it costs two hundred and fifty dollars a month for a, a good engineer in Thailand, and it's really hard to compete with especially in manufacturing where the margins are really tight anyway. And the other issue is it, it's not just the cost of the engineers. The, the materials, the supply, the components are about 30% cheaper overseas. So immediately you've got those two differentials. But even if we could fix all these problems, it's still not going to shift the needle too much on, on, on the way it, the center of gravity is right now. So I, I, aren't those the two kind of components of the problem? They are, uh, but not as much as you think. I mean, we're growing very quickly because customers, um, you know, want to, they, they want to solve problems. They want to make money, believe me. I mean, we all want to make money. And uh, parts are cheaper overseas. Uh, we have a strategy for part of this, uh, this, this manufacturing approach of sourcing globally but integrating locally. So that's kind of our little spin on it, right? And it seems to be working. So we get the best pricing everywhere. We have to monitor the quality using some technology that uh, I'll be presenting in a moment. Um, but the um, but the fact remains, the, the engineer overseas is still cheaper than the engineer over here, right? Uh, but what we have done and what others are doing is coming up with cost models that reflect true costs, right? Uh, we've actually assigned um, the values to you know IP theft and risk and you know lost opportunity cost people sending your engineers over there to cal uh, collaborate right, uh, with, with the guys overseas. So what we, when we started our company in 07, 
Um, we, in 08, early 08, we won a large $30 million three-year contract competing head-to-head -head with a Chinese CM, which was owned 50 by, uh, by our OEM customer, right? They owned a majority share. They owned 51%. And we still beat those guys. And the reason why we did is we were able to convince our customer that our cost model with these values assigned to it, right, risk levels, all that stuff, you know, was real. And uh, the only way they bought it is they had a guy from Celestica there that said, you guys are on to something. And when they did it, we were the same price. In fact, in, in some cases, a little cheaper, depending on who ran the model. So we won that business. They were halfway to transferring that product overseas to their own facility. We kept it. We still have it today. And one of the things it has in it is it's a vacuum robot with zero atmosphere. It has something called ferrofluidic seal technology that is still in the U.S., right? It's not, you can't find ferrofluidic seals anywhere today. You know, we're almost 100% sure if that transfer would have happened, you would have been, been able to buy seals anywhere. So, so we did assign dollars to IP, right, and risk. And does it work for everybody? No. That's why, you know, we're all struggling manufacturing, me and my fellow manufacturing guys, because there's some people that will say, Robert, my board is telling me, my CFO, my board says, we're going that way. No matter, I don't care what your model says. I don't care about, you know, keeping jobs here. You know, I'm getting paid to maximize profit. You know, those people, uh, you know, uh, will go ahead and do that regardless of what you say. I'll, I'll mention one more thing that's kind of interesting. A guy named, uh, The guy that Hicks, something Hicks, the, he wrote a book called Activity-Based Costing, right? He's the guru of ABC, okay? Dr. David Anderson, who, who wrote, who came up with the term DFM, is a good friend of mine. He was one of my professors years ago. He's uh, introduced me to, Dr. To, to Mr. Hicks. And of the, he consults for, God, I think 20 or 30 of the Fortune 500 companies. All the guys he consults for have either stayed in the U.S. or brought their operations they really adopt ABC activity based cost. Okay, so this is one of my favorite quotes. Most companies die of indigestion, not starvation. I read this when I was a young engineer, got in the early 80s, and I've seen it over and over and over again. So when we're out there solving problems, right, not only do we have to solve the macroeconomic or societal problems we just talked about, we gotta really focus in on what's driving OEMs crazy. And it's basically things like in a hyper uh, competitive uh, marketplace. Number two is my uh, favorite, lengthening product design cycles. When I ran a robot company and we were just starting, we could design a new product in three months. Then we got successful and shipped 100,000. That same design cycle took three years. Why? Because I was too busy, <laughs> right? fixing and supporting. So we looked for suppliers that could help us, but because they didn't have the OEM level skills, they, they couldn't collaborate at the same level. So we had to come up with other solutions. So we vowed someday to fix that problem, and that's kind of what we're working on today. IP theft we've talked about, um, supply chains that are non-supportive, uh, that don't really work with you guys, with us. Let me just... Uh, if you have a supply chain that's open and works together, and we have technology and philosophical ways to do that, coming up here in a second, a lot of problems get, get done. You know, and, and guys overseas have been doing it for years. Karetsu's, Chables, whatever term you want to use, right? Toyota City, if you haven't ever been there, it's like this hub of a wheel with all their suppliers around it. They own you know, uh, shares in each other's company. The, the, the guys overseas take collaboration to a whole new level. We need to do more of that. So when we're talking about collaboration, it talk, it, we need to talk about, get away from this conflict-based stuff. We always talk about partnering. I used to kid in the 80s that partnering meant something else, like going to the doctor for an exam, that kind of something else. True partnering means you open up, you, you get rid of some of the, the silos that, you're, that members of your supply chain build, and you start working together on, on, on these levels. I mean, I'm actually working with some competitors. You know, we call it coopetition because we're cooperating with our competitors on some projects. That's the level of collaboration we need. Uh, I'm going to move through here a little faster so we can have room for more questions. But 
the OEM skill set, you guys heard me talk about that before. Part of uh, being uh, you know, a link in the collaborative supply chain means you need to have a, a decent understanding of your customer's needs, right? Um, and this kind of just shows, and this is our version, there's other versions of the supply chain, but what we've done here is kind of mapped out what our suppliers or what we need to know to be good suppliers, right? And we need, even though we don't have products ourselves, so to speak, right? We have a product business, but that's a spin out of it. We're a service business. We need to know how to design, source, build, integrate. We need to know what they know. Remember, I mentioned earlier when I was an OEM, we couldn't find suppliers that uh, knew how to do OEM products. It's like your gardener, right? Your gardener does a great job mowing your lawn, but he can't design and build a lawnmower for you, even though he'll tell you he can. And you might believe him until he F's it up, right? So, product people and service people, all hardworking and sharp people, but two different domains. So one of the things that we're pushing, and some other companies are, are seeing it, is that suppliers need to have OEM level of understanding and training to be able to help. You can't get a guy at a machine shop to build a nine-axis hair transplant robot. You just can't. By the time you teach him to do that, you create another competitor, whether it's domestically or internationally. So this OEM skill set is a, is a big um, requirement. And these are some specific attributes, right? We talked about shared business philosophy. You know, we, we turn that into something we call rewarding ethos, understanding the customer's needs. We'll talk about product life cycles, and then helping them as far as infrastructure support and uh, applying unique automation solutions to their manufacturing process. These are all things that we're, we're focusing on. So the rewarding ethos, you know, it's <laughs> some people like it, some people don't, right? I'm a big martial arts guy. The reason why our company is succeeding is we think this way. We came up with a way of thinking based on martial arts. Ted's seen it over there. It's called Business Combatives, Apex, the world's largest operations management society for business. And what, this is a good training system. But it really talks about focusing on the customer and having a warrior, a business warrior mindset. You know, um, these are some of the top uh, attributes, right? that you need to like hire for, you know, more manufacturing people like Numi. We talk about some of the problems with Numi. They weren't doing enough of this. And if you dig deep, the Toyota production system, they have this in spades, right? At Toyota, when you're a top foreman or top quality guy, you don't retire, right? They, a couple years before your retirement, they put you in a sensei division. And you become a sensei. And you develop, you might call it something different, but you, you, your job is to propagate your warrior ethos your business warrior approach to solving problems. And that's one of uh, Toyota's uh, greatest little secrets. Not many people know that. And this is just some more, uh, a, an applied version of it. This is one of the things that um, you know we feel manufacturing people to be good suppliers to OEMs and OEMs. They should collectively learn uh, to focus, right? If you look at the guys that got Osama bin Laden, uh, the Navy SEALs, they asked the guy um, why the SEALs are so successful. He said two reasons. One, clarity of purpose, and two, discipline, train and discipline. And those are very similar to what you need in business. And it talks about all that. So let's talk about product life cycles. Everybody knows the product life cycle. Few people follow it with the, with the amount of zeal or commitment that you need. And if you don't follow it, you know, do it at your own peril. Most of the problems, right, are designed in the beginning Sorry about automation. Is it automation? Yeah. But this is the beginning, uh, the beginning part of the life cycle here. This is where most problems occur, right? But we call that the uh, area of innovation. That's our customer's area. We help them if they need it. So we're OEM capable guys, and our goal is to handle the operating part, right, of the of the business. So we come in here, right, and and other you know manufacturing guys and saying, look, let us take your ideas and productize. Once we productize them, we monetize them over here, and we can support them in the field. So you kind of put all this together, and you have an OEM technology, right? Uh, one that allows you to support and, and you know, collaborate with your customers at a level um, that hasn't been seen in, in American business. Yeah. So this is just a progression. You go from idealization to productization to monetization. The goal is to get here. And when I talk uh, collaboration, my customers, they're open book. We show them our p and This is what we're making, right? It stuns them all because none of our suppliers did that for us. None of my suppliers, all from you know, their partner levels, they did. So 
But that's the kind of collaboration I'm talking about. I mean, we could both monetize together. And some interesting things happen when you kind of open the book, right? Because customers don't want to pay for suppliers' inefficiency. So one of the reasons why we're competitive is we're so lean and mean and efficient, and other suppliers, right, are starting to open up a little bit too, is that the OM goes, wow, I can see your problem there. Is if I help you fix it, we work together, your costs go down, everyone's costs go down, we can be competitive. As, as the guys overseas, their costs are going up, we're working together as a supply chain to drive that cost down. It can also provide infrastructure support. This, I just put this slide here just to show you how many processes a startup needs to start to figure out. This isn't even sales and marketing or design or anything. This is just operational stuff. Companies that work in a collaborative way with an OEM level supplier, all this stuff we manage for them. That's, and that's what our OEMs need. Right? They need to be able to offload all the cost and chaos of operations. Basically, right, what collaborative manufacturing really is, being so good at what you do, so open, you can become an operating partner, provide the operating system or the platform for the customer. Think Apple, right? When your customer becomes more of an app developer and we, right, the high, uh, the OEM level manufacturing partner, we provide a platform for them to run their products on. And that's kind of what you're starting to see out there, right? And you talk about this new breed of manufacturing company it's people using different techniques, but to get to this level. Uh, automation, robotics. When we say automation, we talk about business automation. Robotics is kind of automating labor. Uh, automation we use for automating processes. And this is to your earlier question. You said, how can we guarantee quality? Well, we came up with this, this concept, right? The telepresence robot. We call it the QS. It's a quality sentinel. If the guys at Toyota had these and knew me, the problems would have went away. So what we are doing is because we're sourcing globally and integrating locally, what we're doing is putting these in all of our key suppliers and monitor quality. Because what happens now, if you have a quality problem, you call up your supplier and you know, it takes two, three weeks for you to get there. In some cases, they rent factories. So you go see a different factory. I mean, there's some crazy shell game stuff going on. Here, you log on your PC. You have one of these, and you drive around like you're there. It becomes your avatar. You can do quality inspections, right, surprise audits, uh, all sorts of things to try to keep that collaborative relationship uh, at, a, at a high level. <laughs> yeah, we had to put it on there to make it kind of cute looking. Um, so this is one of many ways we're, we're, you know, we're solving a problem. Other companies are looking at other techniques. But uh, everyone's working on robots that do labor, but very few. Oh, you do? Okay, so, so yeah. There's a scientist at, at Carnegie Mellon that uh, is in a wheelchair. What's the gentleman's name? Um, he's a big advocate at, at CMU, of course. <laughs> yeah, we're working on that. <laughs> that. You're right, it is a flaw. But they're cute, <laughs> and they work. Um, our suppliers and test runs, all of a sudden the quality shoots up because they never know when it's going to turn on and drive around and check and then customers, right? We talk about proximity. Our engineers, e even some that are in Fremont, log on to these just so they don't have to drive from Fremont, right? That's how you got to just shrink it so they're basically there in the moment. Is it a uh, is there someone right on there, or is it its own robot? So you log in, your face will appear here. This is an avatar. It's a remotely controlled robot, so you're mobile. So think Skype and Polycom head on a Segway body. Doesn't have arms, doesn't need to point things, has a green laser pointer so you can see our meaning. So I could have done this whole talk through one of these, right? Um, Telepresence robot. Uh, then this is the software, right? So you'd be driving around the factory looking at your product being built if you're a customer or driving around your supplier's factory and getting all the data, right? Printed out, all quality of life. And it's really being there. In fact, it's better than being there. <laughs> Because you have all the quality data, it's all real time. Exactly. And then this is just the software. It's you know, very adaptive. Everything we do is very adaptive uh, in, a business, in a business uh, operating system. And again, when you look at the other manufacturing guys out there, they're all adapting their techniques, right? A lot of machine shops are coming up with more advanced machine tools. A lot of automation going on there. Because you know, labor, if you get labor out of the equation, 
right? All of a sudden, you put a machine and parts in the same price there as you will. We've actually done that in our lab. And others are out there doing that, too. So there's a race to see who can come up with the most advanced automated machine shop in Silicon Valley right now. That's kind of an interesting race you don't hear about. Um, yes, question? As part of that, do you see uh, the suppliers of, of smaller components coming back to Texas? I mean, say, to being able to do things like motors or gear source, smaller parts in a completely automated fashion to really be able to feed I, I don't. I can't tell you that answer because uh, the people we see coming back are the guys that need integration or final assembly, and the, and that's driven by IP protection, right? So uh, people want to integrate locally, so that uh, because it's hard to reverse engineer a product from one chip or one gear, right? So the overseas guys can look at all the components they want. So, you know, I think components will be built, automated or not, in, in the lowest cost region everywhere, you know, wherever they can find it. But the integration, subassembly, qualification, all that kind of stuff, that's really the main thrust of, of the movement we're seeing. So what's next? I'm wrapping up here, last slides. Um, you know, we had the Manhattan Project, right, in the 40s. We had the space race. I talked a little bit about Semitech, right, in the 80s. Uh, you know, I ran a robot company where we actually, in the 2000s, were the number one wafer handling robot company in the world, beating Kawasaki, Yaskawa. So my point is, it can be done, guys. If we, you know, this nobody can beat us in this kind of thing. If we get out of our little silos and start working together, right? So that's why we think Silicon Valley is going to be the birthplace for this new, the, uh, new higher level of, of, of collaboration across the board. And then I just, I just kind of end with this. This is a profile. If any of you guys are looking for manufacturing partners, this is the kind of company you want to find. So these are the, when you talk about you know what Flex is doing, Tesla, and these are all attributes that come, uh, you know, uh, that are being developed in their supply chain development um, departments. Um, I'll let you kind of just peruse this. This is pretty much a recap of everything we've talked about, <coughs> and that's it. I think I'm on time, right, Ted? You're doing great, and it's a really interesting topic. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm not sure about the us versus them part, I think that it's always important to be rah-rah and everything, and, but I think there's a lot of issues and, and I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to scratch, to, to go deeply into all of them. What's especially exciting to me <clears throat> about what you're doing is you're not just asking the question, sitting in a bar drinking, drinking a discussion, you're, you're trying stuff. And I'm sure there are people here that have interesting questions. Uh, anybody want to start off? So what do you see as the role of modern systems engineering techniques in the design thinking creative system? Do all of your guys learn and work with systems engineering techniques? Yeah, systems engineering is up, is the, uh, there's two things we pride a lot of, you know, all, 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 anybody that's in manufacturing, right, development, that's the program manager on the business commercial side and the systems engineer, whether they're a product systems engineer or a manufacturing systems engineer. Uh, one of the things we've seen is that it's important that uh, hierarchical thinking, you know, is embedded uh, everywhere. And and systems engineers, some people do it naturally. Some people, they need to be taught. I mean, you guys are in the teaching business. You know what I'm, I'm saying. But it's a hard thing to teach. So good manufacturing systems engineers, you know, we're talking about this manufacturing you know, race through operational superiority again. You know, we got to you know, have programs, right? And if you go to school, everyone wants to be a design engineer. I was a manufacturing engineer and a design engineer growing up, and when I was a manufacturing engineer, people laughed at me. They said, you know, you're not a real engineer. In Japan, manufacturing engineer, you're up there. It's prestigious. We need to change that. Yeah, you just alluded to a cultural change that I think is really important. And also, in, in, the, in the Valley here, we need to have a cultural change, too, because this idea of a manufacturer has always been this kind of second class that's not that, that important. But as product life cycles get shorter and shorter, <clears throat> the ecosystem needs to evolve to have partners like you to be able to work symbiotically with the smaller startup companies. Do you see that, that the, the start of that movement right now? Forgive me for talking so much. Do you see that movement kind of starting off right now? Yes, I, I do. In fact, um, the, the, the fact that Cassidy found all these companies out there, right, trying to develop manufacturing, new technologies. And uh, there's all these, um, guys, what is the, the funniest one? There's all these little groups, right? 
the makers have all these little social events. You know, we get invited to all of them. So there's this really interesting sharing of information. What makes a, a maker different than a traditional entrepreneur is they're open with everything. They will give you everything. And we think we're pretty open, you know, but not compared to these, these, these young entrepreneurs. So they started this one called uh, Autonomous Anonymous. Have you heard of this one? Where it's a bunch of robot manufacturing and design people getting together and collaborating at bars. Autonomous Anonymous. Yeah. So they do a lot of drinking, but they come up with some really neat ideas. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you pointed out that uh, the Japanese have been doing something like collaborative manufacturing for decades. And I didn't hear you talk about how what the American Red Cure Diet happens to do is different from that. Can you just replicate it with the Japanese or that's not really exciting work for us? Because we could we could build it with the doing that for doing it better thing for us. That's great, but I'm not quite sure I understand what that means. Great great point. So kind of I'm a big fan of, of of the Japanese, you know, being a martial arts guy, you know, you can't help but love, right, the culture and uh, they're great engineers. They're great, you know, uh, business guys. When it's cookie cutter, right? You know, creativity-wise, they have some challenge. But I know it's changing, right? But uh, one, one thing, one statistic I found out very interesting that the world's only freestanding self-adjusting robot was done here in Silicon Valley. All the robot stuff done over there, you know, those that, that Asimov robot. All those guys, you push it over, it'll fall. It'll keep moving like a toy, right? They're great at mechatronics. They're great at replicating. They're great at all those types of things. What they're missing there is what we have in spades here, largely because we're a melting pot, right? They're a, pretty much a homogeneous society. Here, we're a melting pot of people from all over the world. So we have giant intersections everywhere. So the creativity level here is, is really high, and I think that's the big difference. The collaborative part is different than doing it with the The collaborative part here, the collaboration for the sake of collaboration isn't. You're right. Because they have Koretsus there, and, and we learned from that. I studied Koretsus and was inspired by them. What's different here, when we talk about collaborative manufacturing, we're talking about OEM level people, right? Companies that do nothing but help product companies, even though they could be a pro their product is their service, right? So it's, it's collaborative is probably a, a generic term, uh, but it's the OEM level, the peer to peer collaboration is probably a better term. And that's, I think, a refinement and improvement. Over those yeah, and, and just to build on what you're saying with Pat and, and, and the direction of the talk, I mean, is if you look at a place like Little Garage, where they're pushing out kind of open source software for robotic uh, development, you see that sort of ecosystem taking place, and, and, and Scott's working on a similar kind of color processing device, too, for, for similar kind of applications. And I, th I think, you know, to Pat's point, we can develop a better ecosystem because it's disaggregated. Whereas in Japan, it's pretty homogenous. Yes, very yes. Close. Very close. Very, very, very close. close. They're, they're yeah. don't, that's open collaboration, I think. Yeah, the that's, another, there, that's another great way of explaining it. Correct, I mean, you're the family. You, oh, you and it's, it, 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 it's, it's a collaborative collaboration, but it's, it's, just, it's, it's wholly owned yeah. collaboration. So, so, you know, just, I have to jump in. I, I remember when I first went over as a, as a research uh, scientist to try to turn something into something in Japan, and it was a completely different experience of working with the engineering people, the manufacturing engineering people in Lexington and Boca and Yamasa and those guys over there. They were so gung-ho and so excited. I got totally transformed. I wanted to be a manufacturing engineer. But they were shocked at the way I thought and the things I wanted to try and how I wanted to try it, like most people. But the, um, what, I, what I kind of am struck by when I went to the Muir factory is he's got this setup where he's got this factory and then he has this chair for the R&D guy that someone from the Valley would come in and sat down kind of to be part of and watch and, and create that manufacturing step. And I think that this is what's trans that, that, that understanding and, and embracing of that transformation is what really nobody's done a very good job of. You know, what they've done before is they know how to manufacture, these guys know how to understand. But, but making the, the on-ramp, that's really a Silicon Valley come together, you, you know, we're going to outsource the whole stuff. And that, that, that's where the collaboration, we'll be a different kind, I hope, of collaboration than we've had or we've seen in, in, in the, in the technology, we used to call it technology transfer, and it never worked, right? It never, it never worked in big companies, it never worked anywhere. And so, and, you know, yeah, so I think that's, uh, I don't know what's on. 
Does anybody have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we might want one last question, but really it's 2:30, and it's it's a great time for people to, to share out there. I think what's really exciting about your talk, by the way, Robert, is, is that you did. It, it, people really did get it, get into this talk, and, and I and I really think you've done a great job of bringing this into this new uh, new thinking that you're doing. And I really do think that there's there's something new, and that's that's why I really wanted to have you here. And, and I hope a lot of people see something in you. So thank you. Oh, one last question. One, no, So how do you, what do you see the role of universities in all this? Oh, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of teaching. I, I've taught myself at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I think the universities are, are, are is a key partner, right? I see them as a key partner. Um, I see them uh, being part of that, that the tip of the spear, if you will, in trying to convince our kids to be, you know, more of them to be engineers, and of those engineers, more of them to be manufacturing engineers. Well, uh, research into manufacturing systems, right? I think there's a lot of great R&D going on. No one can beat our educational system for, for pure R&D. But there's a lot of manufacturing systems engineering work that I think uh, is cool. Industrial engineering, I remember I was at a company I won't name, and I tried to hire um, this guy, who, and they wouldn't hire him because he had an industrial engineering degree. I couldn't believe it. So I snuck him in the back door. I, they wouldn't let me hire him as an engineer. So I snuck him in the back door as a as a CAD a drafter, more correct, as a drafter, right? And now he's their senior optical research scientist with an industrial engineering degree. So we need to do a better job working with you guys to tell you guys what we need, and you guys hopefully can do a better job making it sexy and cool to be a manufacturing system guy. Thank you. Thank you very much, and let's just uh, meet out in the hall.